This world will tell you, grow as a person. Know more. Increase your knowledge. Be a better person. But you know what I realized? The best version of yourself is when you're Christ-like. Build up one another. Now tell your seatmate. One, two, three, go. Build up. That's why we exist. We are to encourage. We are to strengthen one another. You know, we need to define what it means when you say build up one another. And this is the definition of build up one another. To build up one another means to help each other become more like Jesus in character, Christ-likeness, and in the way we love. Because this world will tell you, grow as a person. Know more. Increase your knowledge. Be a better person. But you know what I realized? The best version of yourself is when you're Christ-like. That's the best version of yourself. Don't ever believe the, the, the ideologies in this world. That you, if you're better mentally, if you know a lot of stuff. And those things are good. But without becoming Christ-like, it's incomplete. Because the best version of ourselves is when we are Christ-like. The best version of loving others is when we love like Christ. So that's our goal. That's why what's our message again? Build up one another. Now you might be asking, what's the connection of this message to 1 Corinthians chapter 14? You know what? In all the chapters... In 1 Corinthians, this is the, one of the most challenging, one of the most difficult, and it has caused the body of Christ to agree to disagree. And that's why I want you to be attentive because as we study this together, we will learn that this is the point of Paul to the churches. We are to build up one another. What's our message again? Let's say it together. Build up one another. Now, how do we do that? Two ways to do that, and we can see that in the chapter. Number one, we need to develop the right desire. And number two, we need to do it the right way. So what does it mean to develop the right desire? The reality is, majority of us, I believe we are, we know already we are to build up one another. Even if you're not yet, you know, a committed follower of Jesus, you know that you are to build up, encourage, strengthen one another, edify, lift up one another. But the problem is that not the knowledge, but the desire. Do we have the right desire? Because if our desire is not to build up, you're not going to do that. I'm not going to strengthen other people. I'm not going to encourage other people. That's why our struggle is self-centeredness. And that's why in our series, we started with chapter 12, and then last week, chapter 13, and today, chapter 14. The center of these three chapters is chapter 13. What does chapter 13 say? Let's look at this passage. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. Paul knew that to build up one another, we are to use our spiritual gifts. Whether your gifts is prophecy or speaking in tongues or mercy, or administration, leadership, whatever that is. Our role is to use these gifts to build up one another. You know, all of us, I really believe, we have one, two, or three spiritual gifts that God has given to us. But here, this is, is what can be problematic when we have our gifts. We can use our God-given gifts for selfish reasons. You know why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 14? Because the Christians in Corinth are starting to become selfish. They're using their gifts to edify themselves. They're using their gifts to exhort themselves rather than to build up one another. Now let's go, go to our passage. And again, this passage is challenging, but it's beautiful. When I, the more I study this, the more I realize, wow, this was your point, Paul. And this is also happening in our generation today. Look at what he says in verse 1. He says, pursue love, connecting to chapter 13. Love is basically the motive why we serve. Yet, 
desire earnestly spiritual gifts. So he's not rebuking them that don't use your gifts. He's saying, yes, ask God for spiritual gifts. Desire that. Seek the Lord. Because Paul knew that they needed to learn that the only person who can give gifts is God, the Holy Spirit. It will not come out from them. It's God who's going to give to them. So desire earnestly from the Lord spiritual gift. But he specified one spiritual gift here. And what did he say? But especially the gift of prophecy. And then he compared it to what? Look at the next verse. In verse 2, he says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands. But in his spirit, he speaks mystery. Now let me explain what's happening in the church of Corinth. Because if you read the entire chapter, paulit ulit, it's repetitive. He's talking about prophecy, tongues, prophecy, tongues. The problem with the church of the Christians in Corinth, they were so fascinated with speaking in tongues. I think they heard someone speak in tongues, or maybe Paul was speaking in tongues. And then they noticed that this person that was speaking in tongues, it seems like he's spiritual. And it seems like he's, you know, mature. And that there's something amazing that's happening to that person. So a lot of them were saying, I like that gift. I like that gift. I want to speak in tongues. I want to speak in tongues. But no one understands. And it's becoming chaotic in the church assembly. That's why he compared it with prophecy. Because verse 3 says, But one who prophesies speaks to men for what purpose? Edification, you build them up. Exhortation, you lift them up. Consolation, you encourage them. That's what Paul wants the body of Christ in Corinth to do. Because what's our message again? Build up one another. So what is prophecy? Let's define what prophecy is. From the Greek word, prophecy meaning to speak forth. What are you going to speak forth? With the power of the Holy Spirit, what words? The very words of God for the purpose of the edification of others. That's the main purpose why God gives us the gift of prophecy. He reveals His words. It's connected to His word in the Bible, in the Scripture. And He allows us to share it to others. What are some examples of prophecy? It could be preaching God's word. Just like the pastors, the preachers, the teachers. Because they get the word, the, the word from God connected to the Scripture and they share it to other people. That's prophecy. Another one, and it's not limited to preaching Another one is to pray for one another. But there are moments that some people would ask for your prayer request and their situation is so dire, you don't know the right words to say. And then you ask God, Lord, could you give me wisdom what to say to this person because I don't know she is sick or she just lost his family. I don't know what to say. And then God will just you know, reveal the right words to pray for that person. That's prophecy. Another one is to encourage. Right? There are people who think they have gift of encouragement but everybody says, never ako na-encourage sa'yo, right? Because we need God's wisdom, God's you know, prophetic utterances to be able to say the right words to one another. And then rebuke one another. I don't know if you realize this, but it's not easy to rebuke one another. Majority of the time when I rebuke someone, the person will get offended. But what if we can rebuke someone and the person receives it from the heart? Who does that? Not me. God is the one who does that. And God will give you the right words to say to the person so that you'll rebuke the person the right way and then repentance will happen. Sharing the good news. There are people in our lives that we try to share the gospel, the good news about Jesus. But you know, they're just too proud. They know a lot of things about the Bible and they feel like they don't need God. And then suddenly God will give you the right words to connect to that person. That's prophecy. Or another one is you, somebody will cast God's vision or direction in your life. Because, but take note, it should be connected to God's word. Now the last one, a lot of people somehow question this. Because some people take abuse this gift that God revealed to me something that this is what's going to happen to you. But you know what? If it's connected to God's word, then it's from the Lord. I remember before, this was 2021. Somebody prayed for me and my wife, or two of them from another church, a Bible-believing church, uh, and they were praying for me and my wife about what God, and in and, and that prayer, of course, we received the prayer, it was in Zoom meeting, and the, the two of them were saying, you know, I see that God will expand your borders, I see that God will allow you to reach more churches also, not just be a blessing to CCF, but other churches. And I, I'll be honest with you, I was a bit skeptical because my leaning is a little bit conservative. 
So, so I said, okay, it's a generic prayer. Yeah, God could expand my borders. And then he was praying, and I see that God will allow you to reach more campuses. More churches will be blessed. So I said, okay, Lord, if it happens, then good. If it doesn't happen, then it's okay. I'm content where you lead me. But two years after, 2023, last May, I was voted or appointed as the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches, PCEC, Youth Movement Chairman. Last May 2023. What does that mean? Yes, let's give glory to God. But what does that mean? PCEC is overseeing 55, over 55,000 churches, helping them thrive and have a wonderful church ministry. And God has placed in my heart the desire to hopefully that all youth movement in our country will thrive. All campuses will have discipleship movements and more young people will come to know Jesus. And when I remember, when, this, when that happened and I remember the prayer, I said, that's from the Lord. I'm not saying that the guy was a prophet because we already have the full revelation of God in his word, but that prophecy was from the Lord. How do I know that's from the Lord? Two things. Number one, what he prayed about was not against God's word. And number two, it happened. Where can we find that? Deuteronomy 18. Let's look at how we test prophecy. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So in other words, that's why when I received that prayer and I remembered it after it happened, that's really from God because God is the only one powerful enough to make it happen. Remember this. Remember this also. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but so that we don't get deceived, so that we don't get manipulated, examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Not every prophetic utterances is from the Lord. Our role is to examine it carefully. Look at this statement. Let's read this together. The message God reveals to us for other people will never never contradict his word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's read this together. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. For what purpose? So that the man of God, all of us, will be adequate, equipped for every good work to build the body of Christ. So that's the gift of prophecy. It's always connected to God's word. Now let's look at speaking in tongues. Because this gift is the gift that somehow has caused the body of Christ to agree to disagree. But let's understand it together based on what Paul wrote in the passage. The one who speaks in tongue does not speak, speak to man, but to God. So there's a purpose. It's to God. No one understands it's mysterious. Right? So we don't understand unless it's interpreted. Now I want to show this chart because Pastor Peter showed this. Because again, there are two extremes. That's, you know, in the, in the body of Christ. Some people, they believe that tongues, speech, the speaking in tongues cease already. But we can see in the scripture that it doesn't. It doesn't have a strong support. I studied this. I studied both sides. It doesn't have a strong biblical support that tongues have ceased. The other one are saying, if you're really a Christian, you speak in tongues. I don't speak in tongues. Does that mean I'm not a, a genuine Christian? A lot of us don't speak in tongues. Does that mean we're not genuine Christians? So that also doesn't have biblical strong support. But there's a balance. And Paul explained it. But here's the definition of speaking in tongues. Let's read this together. A language that came from the Holy Spirit from God for two possible purposes. First is to edify oneself. And then some Christians, they don't want to accept that. But you read the passage, that's one of the main purposes. And second, when interpreted, edifies others. Because now you understand. Now let's look at the passage. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. One who speaks in a tongue, what? Edifies. Clear na clear, huh? edifies himself. It's not for the church, it's for you personally. Now, it's so hard to accept this, especially if we're not a practitioner. But I know of pastors of certain people who practice this on their own, that they speak in tongues by communicating with God and somehow they're edified. 
I don't understand because I don't have that gift. But when they share me these stories, I realize that yes, this is really from the Lord because you grow in Christ likeness. You grow in love. But one who prophesies, what happens? It edifies the church. And look at the prayer of Paul, the desire of Paul here. I wish that you all oh, spoke in tongues. So it's not a bad gift. It's not something that I, 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 I'm, I'm not going I'm, I'm to do that. That's evil. No, he, Paul is saying it's a good gift. Even more that you would prophesy. But in the body of Christ, let's encourage, build up one another. Because greater is one who prophesy than one who speaks in tongues unless, there's a caveat, it is interpreted. So that the church may receive edifying. Since we don't understand it, we need someone to interpret. Therefore, we understand. And look at the next verse. If then I do not know the meaning of the language. So if somebody tries to encourage you and you don't understand, I will be the one who speaks a barbarian. And the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. If somebody speaks to me and I don't understand, how will I be encouraged? If I speak to you and you don't understand, how will you be encouraged? So you also, since you are zealous, there's that word. They were so zealous for spiritual gifts. But the speaking in tongues lang. They were so focused on speaking in tongues that Paul was telling them, yes, be zealous. But what kind of gift should you be zealous for? Seek to abound for the edification of the body of Christ. What's our message again? Build up. One another. That's why, look at the next verse. Look at his desire. Therefore, let the one who speaks in a tongue pray that he interprets. He's saying, okay, okay, you're fond of speaking in tongues. You want to practice that in church. But you pray that someone interprets. Para naman, so that everybody will be blessed, not just you. So that the body of Christ will be edified and other people will not get confused. And look at the next verse. This is the heart of Paul. For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. I thank God even he confessed. He's speaking in tongues. But he's doing it in front of God, individually, personally. However, in the church, in the congregation, this is what we call corporate worship, whether in small groups, house church, or in a big congregation. I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words and nobody understand. I was in another country, I think, years ago, and they were praying in, a, in their own dialect. In fact, they were singing songs in their own dialect. And I couldn't worship properly. I just prayed on my own because I don't understand. And that's what happens when somebody speaks in tongues and we don't understand. Let's look at this quotation. Someone whose heart is aligned to God's will is one who will use his or her God-given gifts to what? Bless others. So in other words, if my heart is aligned to God, I'm going to serve. I'm going to be part of a small group. I'm going to serve my small group. I'm going to serve my family. I'm going to serve in church. And if you're not serving in church, I don't know if your heart is aligned to God. If you're not using your gifts to serve other people, to bless other people, to become more like Christ, I don't know if your heart is aligned to God. Now, if you're serving, that's good. But if you're serving with RM or wrong motives, I also don't know if your heart is aligned to God. Because someone who's aligned to God, he's going to use his spiritual gifts to bless other people. How do I develop this desire? Two things to develop this desire. You need to have time with the Lord. How will you develop the love for others if you're not growing yourself in your love for God? That's why chapter 13 is in the middle. The love of God compels us to love others, to build each other up. And you need to have fellowship with other believers. How will you know their needs? If they need mercy, if they need support, if they need prayer, encouragement, prophecy, whatever that is, if you are not having fellowship with fellow believer, believers. What's our message again? One, two, three, go. Build up one another. So to build up one another, we are to develop the right desire. It starts from the heart and we do it the right way. You won't do it the right way. We won't do it the right way if we don't have the right desire, backed up by love. So we need to do it the right way. Why is that very important to do it the right way? Because every spiritual gift that we have, whether it's exhortation, leading worship here, administration, leadership, prophecy, or speaking in tongues, should be done God's way. And for whose glory? God's glory. Not for our own. It should be God's way. Look at what Paul is saying to the Corinthian believers. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. 
And you know what, you know what that means, children, in your thinking? You're immature. And immature people are selfish people. You're just thinking about yourself. Don't be children in the way you serve. Yes, be infant in evil things. Definitely be innocent when it comes to evil. But in your thinking, in the way you serve a church, in the way you worship God, be mature. It's not just about you. It's about Jesus. It's about the body of Christ. And then, and I want you to listen to this because the next verse is, it's very challenging to understand, and I'm going to explain that to all of us. Look at the next verses that he shared. In the law, it is written, what? By men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to these people, and even so, they will not listen to me. And then in verse 22, he made a declaration. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Okay, so tongues are for a sign for unbelievers. But, and some people have, you know, misinterpreted this. But prophecy is for a sign not for unbelievers, but to those who believe. Okay, so prophecy is just for the body of Christ. But then in the next verses, I want you to pay attention. Look at the next verses. Therefore, if the, what? All of us, whole congregation assembles, together and all speak in tongues. And an ungifted man, men, unbeliever enter. Will they not say that you are mad? Wait a minute, Paul. Sabi mo lang, you just said the tongues are for unbelievers. And now you're saying if we do that, they will, you know, think that we're mad. So it's not for unbelievers. And then look at verse 24. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by his sins. And then the secrets of his heart are disclosed. And then he will fall on his face. He's going to worship God. And then he will realize that God is certainly among you. Now let us explain and understand what Paul is saying here. Now here are two possible meaning, meanings of tongues for unbelievers. Some say it's connected to Acts chapter 2. It's for evangelism. That's why they're saying, you know, tongues is just for others. It's not for the edifying of self. It's just for other believers. What does Acts chapter 2 say? This is when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. They started speaking in tongues. And the other nationalities who were there, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, Egyptians, Libya, Syria, Cyrene, Rome, and Jews from other countries, other nationalities, they heard it in their own language. And they were cut to the heart. And they said, mighty deeds of God. They said, these are, this is, they're talking about the mighty deeds of God. But when you study 14, chapter 14, he's not connecting this to chapter 2 of the book of Acts. It's not connected. What's more connected is Isaiah 28. That's why I want you to listen for us to understand this. What does Isaiah 28, 11, and 12 says? Ayan po, yung nakakote. What does it say? It says in the law, this is Isaiah 28. By men of strange tongues and by lips of strangers, I will speak to these people. And even so, they will not listen to me. Now, what is he saying here? Verse 22 is connected to verse 21. That's why the phrase, so then, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to un unbelievers. Who? The Israelites. What happened to the Israelites? The northern kingdom, prophets came to them. Repent, magbago na kayo. You change. They didn't listen. In Isaiah 28, God said to the Israelites, since you didn't listen to my prophets, I'm going to send, uh, send a group of people, an army, the Assyrian Empire, with strange tongues and lips of strangers, and I will use them to judge you because you are unbelievers. Now, do you get verse 22, why he said it's for unbelievers? It's pertaining to Isaiah 28. It's an example telling the people in Corinth, look at what happened to the Israelites. They heard lips of strangers, but let's read the next line. Even so, did they listen to the lips of strangers? What did the verse say? They did not what? Listen. How come they didn't listen? They don't understand. So instead of understanding the judgment of God, they still didn't repent. So the verse was talking about Isaiah 28. And in that verse, God used lips of tongues for an unbeliever. And God used prophecy for those Israelites who believe. Now what Paul is saying is this. If the Israelites didn't repent by lips of strangers, what more? Be because they didn't understand that. Huh? What more in the church? Let's say you speak in tongues. You know connection in 23 to 25. Let's say you speak in tongues. We speak in tongues here. And then a first timer come, comes in. And everybody speaks in tongues. What will they say? Ay, iba to. They're going to go out. They're going to walk out. 
hindi Korean, hindi Japanese, hindi Indian. I don't know what this is. It's all confusing. That's why Paul is saying, it's not edifying to unbelievers. Now, if you prophesy, someone speaks, someone encourages, someone prays in their own native language, they will get convicted because it's from the Word of God and God is using that to edify the body of Christ. What's our message again? Build up one another. Again, tell your seatmate. One, two, three, go. Build up. That's the meaning of those verses. And then he further explained, just to clarify the order of worship. Look at verse 26 of chapter 14. What is the outcome then, brethren, if we do it in an orderly manner, if we do it pleasing the Lord? This is the outcome. When you assemble, one has a psalm, another one has a teaching, another one has a revelation, a tongue and an interpretation. And look at what he says. Let all things be done for edification. So he's not singling out speaking in tongues. He's also saying in the way you teach, make it orderly, make it edifying. In the way you encourage, make it edifying. I shared earlier, there are people who think that's their gift, encouragement, but nobody has been encouraged by that person. So do it in an edifying way. When there's a revelation, do it in an edifying way. When you are re re a gift of exhortation, do it in an edifying way. And then he gave a guide. Look at what the guide is. Verse 31 to 33. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. Imagine if we have three speakers here every Sunday. I'm speaking, and then Pastor Ricky is speaking, and then Pastor Bong is speaking. I'm speaking 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And then Pastor Ricky in his heart, no, let's talk about 1 Corinthians 13. Then Pastor Bong says, no, let's look at the book of Psalms, chapter 139. kami preach. Will you understand? Will you say, wow, I'm so blessed? No, you're not going to do that. It's confusing. All of us speaking at the same time, we're not going to be edified. It should be one by one in an orderly manner. And look at verse 32, because verse 32 is very important. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. If God has revealed to you a prophecy, and it's only you who has that revelation, and nobody agrees with you, and those other people are also Christian, solid leaders, I don't think that's from God. Because God is not a God of confusion. This protects us from abusive usage of prophecy. Because some people, they would just you know, go to, to you and say, I receive this prophecy. Or in a D group, they would just say, I receive all of these things. But what if it's not from the word of God? And that's why we have leaders who study the word of God also so that we can be accountable to one another. And then look at 1 Corinthians 14 as we end the chapter. Therefore, my brethren, earnestly, Desire, desire the right gifts, desire the gifts that will edify the body, specifically prophecy. And do not forbid to speak in tongues. Now, I have a side note here. Never believe the lie that once someone is speaking in tongues, he's not a believer. Because somehow there are Christians who would say, if somebody's speaking in tongues, he's not a believer. That's not in the scripture. Even Paul says, do not forbid people if they speak in tongues to edify themselves. God gave that gift for certain kinds of people. Even though majority of CCFers, we don't have that gift, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And there are also people who doesn't speak in tongues. They're more conservative leaning, but they're not genuine believers. It doesn't, it's not dependent whether you're speaking in tongues or not. It's dependent when you are, if you are truly a follower of Jesus. But there's verse 40. All things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. When we build up one another, who's glorified? God. That's his desire for the church. Imagine if all of us are serving each other. Imagine if all of us are part of a ministry. People will be blessed and God will be glorified. What's our message again? Build up one another. We are called not to consume, but to contribute to the body of Christ. Let's not be consumer Christians. Let's contribute to the body of Christ. Again, tell your seatmate, build up one another. So how do we do that? You apply this in your family. 
Whatever gifts you have, you apply this in your D group. You apply this at church. You have a gift of mercy, apply it there. You have a gift of leadership, you apply it there. You have a gift of exhortation, encouragement, you apply it there. You, I know all of us are gifted. Again, tell your seatmate, you are gifted. Sabi mo, all of us, guys. Even if you think that I don't have that much gift, you are gifted. You are valuable in God's sight. God wants to use you for His glory. And God wants you to make an impact in other people's lives. Serve in the church as well. There are many ministries here, whether welcome ministry, in the welcome center, in the kids' church. There's so many ministries. We keep on promoting it. But not all of us are serving. Imagine if all of us are serving. You know, this place would be full of people because they will be encouraged that we are all serving one another. And look at 2 Peter chapter 1 because maybe some of us, we have so many excuses why we don't serve. Look at verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 1. Seeing that His divine power has what? Granted to us everything pertaining to life and we all have what we need to serve Him. We don't have an excuse anymore. Why do we do this? Why do we need to build up one another? Look at this question. And look at what she said earlier. Because how can I not serve and love others when the God of the universe served and gave His life for me so that I will be saved? Why won't I do that? Jesus gave His life for me. He died on the cross to pay for my sins. If you receive in Him, you have eternal life. You don't have anything to be afraid. That's why there's that verse, He came to serve. Why wouldn't I do that for others? He served us so that the wages of our sin will be paid for. That's what Romans 6.23 is. For the wages of sin is death. It's not good works that will save you. It's only Jesus that will save you. That's why He had to come. It's not attending church that will save you. Only Jesus will save you. Now reflect on that goodness because that love should motivate us to build up one another. I don't know where you are in your spiritual life, but can we just bow our heads? I want to pray for you. I don't know how this message is spoken to you. Maybe for some of you, you don't have that relationship with Jesus. And I want to pray for two specific groups of people here today. For some of you, you've been hearing the gospel many times already. You heard that Jesus loves you. You heard that Jesus died for you. But you don't, you just don't want to humble yourself. I'm asking you, please humble yourself today. God loves you. Nothing else can save you, only Jesus. Take Him seriously. Receive Him in your heart. And I promise you, your life will never be the same. If you're that person, you pray something like this. Jesus, please forgive me for all my sins. Thank you that you died for my sins. Thank you that you love me completely. Today I realize that I need you. I can't save myself without you. So today, I receive you in my heart as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life and change me. For the second group of people that I want to pray for, Lord, majority of us, we have a relationship with you. But please forgive us for being selfish, Lord. Forgive us if there are times we just attend church to consume rather than to contribute. Forgive us if there are times we just serve out of our convenience, not because we care. Please change our hearts. Give us the right desire to build up one another because that's what a church is supposed to be. And help us do it the right way, to use our gifts, to edify, to build up. And this is our desire for CCF, that all of us worldwide will serve one another. And I know you are glorified when we do that. We thank you. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all.